I think this could easily be one of the best breads I ever made. This one looks so perfect. This really is the perfect bread. Moin and Gluten Tag. I am really excited to show you this recipe. I have been working on it for months and will show you the condensed versions with all my failures and learnings. Now everyone around you is going to love you for this amazing bread. I'll start by showing you a quick recap of all my ups and downs. Then afterwards, I will show you step by step how to make this masterpiece. I added chapters to this video. That way you can easily navigate and skip to the parts that interest you the most. And of course, existing subscribers will know, I like to explain the why behind the recipe. This makes following at home a lot easier and increases your chances to nail this bread. Okay, you hobby bakers can relate. My emotional journey on whole wheat began when I went to a farmer nearby and bought me some high class organic flour. I milled it and was really excited to bake with it, but then just baked the beautiful frisbee. <laughs> Existing subscribers will know that in a moment like this, where I'm feeling very down, I resort to the last method, cry farting. <laughs> Seriously, you should try this. You will feel so much better afterwards. But I would never give up. I got back on my feet and continued. I had a plan. I made another iteration, adjusting my fermentation times. And voila, I had some oven spring. But still the bread just didn't have that airy crump that I wanted to achieve. And knowing my flour might have too little gluten to achieve oven spring, I mixed in vital wheat gluten and also increased the water amount. The bread was a little bit better, but still not what I wanted to achieve. I hit a dead end. Some other YouTubers suggested to sift out the bran, as the bran might be cutting into the gluten network. And being very desperate, I also tried that. However, the bread was maybe 1 or 2 percent better. Not giving up, I decided to visit Monika, one of Germany's finest millers. I wanted to learn more about the full milling process, thinking something might be wrong with my flour. My biggest learning was that not every whole wheat flour has the same baking properties. To develop great baking properties, you need to have a lot of sun. Now Hamburg is probably one of the most beautiful cities, but probably has the worst weather on the whole planet. Not the best conditions to grow wheat, I figured. So I decided to go shopping for a different whole wheat flour in Italy. One which I hoped had better baking properties. And so hope returned to me. I had oven spring and a fairly good crumb. I was very happy, as happy as typically emotionally neutral people from Hamburg can be. Seriously, do Hamburgians have feelings? However, I was still not where I wanted to be, but I suddenly saw light at the end of the tunnel and figured I can take it from here with a few more experiments. The first experiment I conducted showed that cold proofing has slightly more oven spring, but not necessarily a better crumb. The second experiment showed that you definitely should preheat your oven before you bake, even more important for wet doughs. This resulted in a lot more oven spring. Now the third experiment showed that you get more oven spring the hotter your oven is at the start of the bake. I previously always baked at a constant temperature. I was getting there. But then my fourth experiment was somewhat of a breakthrough. I started to experiment with the autolysis. That's a fancy word for just mixing flour and water and then waiting. I typically did that overnight. And well. Here are my findings. I figured something might be wrong with my autolysis and those are the results. Left hand side I screwed up shaping. Then here I did the shaping a little bit, bit better. Same though, so you have more oven spring. Showing you bad shaping, better shaping, more oven spring. And now those have been autolysed overnight and now at the right hand side where I skipped the autolysis completely. <laughs> Look at this incredible oven spring. All that hard work finally started to pay off. And so I was finally able to develop this amazing recipe for you. Hope you enjoy. I'm really excited about this recipe because I got myself a new set of whole wheat flour with which I never baked before. And I want to show you how I approach a new flour like this and turn this into an amazing bread. And now what's important to know is you want to have a whole wheat flour that is good in terms of baking properties. The ones in Germany typically don't have as much protein. And this is because we don't have enough sun. In general, the more protein you have inside of your flour, the longer you can ferment it and the more you can inflate your bread, resulting in a better crumb and more oven spring. And this is really crucial to know. If you want to bake a bread like this, you need to have excellent flour. 
If you were to mill your own flour at home, which you could do, you want to make sure that you have a good grain that also has high protein content. And you want to make sure that you mill it at least two or three times. I also learned that when I was visiting the mill, it should be very finely milled to have similar baking properties to a bread flour, for instance. I'll be sharing the details of the flour in the description. And now let's enjoy this. This is definitely going to be a very, very fun experiment. And I'm excited to show you also a little bit scared because yeah i never baked with this flour before and i'm curious to see how this is going to work out now every flour is unique if you understand that and embrace that you will level up as a baker for new flour i always like to do a max hydration test based on some recipes i found on the interwebs people have been going for around 70 to 100 grams of water per 100 grams of whole wheat flour to not make the recipe too difficult, I kept the range at 90%. I then proceed and set up multiple batches of my flour and just mix it with different water amounts. From left to right, 75%, 80%, 85%, 90% water based on the flour. I let that sit overnight and check the gluten development in the morning. Give this a shot with your own flour, you will be surprised. Bad news, you have to do this again for every new flour you get. Let's check out what happened. And in the morning time, this is how the dough looks like. Let me start with the 75% hydration one. Just wetting my hands a little bit. Mm -hmm. This definitely came to dinner. This dough is looking good, but it feels relatively stiff. Okay, this one already feels much nicer. It's much easier to lift. I still get a good window pane on this one. I would prefer this dough definitely over the other one. That was the 80% hydration one. Let's check the 85% hydration one. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. It feels similar, but it feels a little more elastic. But at the same time, it also does not feel too elastic. Okay. This one would be my favorite so far. And now let's check the 90% hydration one. Wow. <laughs> okay, this one is definitely very elastic. Okay, but it might be a little bit too elastic already for my taste. Um, so this one definitely feels way better even than I would say the first one. But for me getting started, I would probably decide between 80 and 85% hydration. 90% it could work. It could work, but trying this recipe for the first time, I feel more comfortable going for the 85% hydration one. Yeah, we'll just look at the 90% again. And I love the challenge. And in a later experiment, I actually bumped the hydration to 100%. I pretty much just needed my sourdough starter, which has 100% hydration. And the results were still amazing. I'm actually amazed by this flour, this gluten here for a whole wheat flour. This is really good. Okay, so I have decided that I'm gonna be going for the 85% just because I feel it's not too elastic, but at the same time, it's still relatively elastic. Yep, have to be a little bit careful there, uh, but from the consistency, I like this one the most. So yeah, what I wanted to show you is when you have a new flour, you need to make sure to test this a little bit. And using this method, uh, I now have my personal favorite, which is the 85% hydration one. And that's what I'll be using for the main dough then. I'll not be throwing any of this away. I'll be tossing that into my discard starter jar and I'll make a really nice uh, bread out of this. The link for that I, I'm sharing in the description. Sehr gut. Now that you figured out the hydration for your flour, you are able to proceed. Let me give you a quick overview of the full process. Sorry, the software engineer in me just loves flowcharts. On Thursday evening, you need to ready your sourdough starter. Just giving a Thursday here as an example, it could be any day of the week that works for you. Your starter should be nice and active. This is crucial for the success of this recipe. I recommend you to have your starter for at least two days at room temperature prior to starting with this recipe. Give it at least two to three feedings before. 
Please also check out my four tips for creating a more active stutter in case you feel this could be an issue for you. This is really essential. On Friday or the next day, we proceed and mix all the ingredients together. Then we start building those strength. You can do this by hand, which I'll do in this video, or you can use a stand mixer. This together with the sourdough is essential. You really want to build a very strong gluten network. We then proceed with a hack I love. We extract a small fermentation sample. This sample will tell us when the dough is done fermenting. And this really makes it so easy. You don't have to rely on any timings. Your dough will tell you when it's ready. Adding the starter commences the bulk fermentation stage. It's called bulk because typically you make many loaves at the same time. During the course of the bulk fermentation, I recommend you to add one to three stretch and folds to your dough. You want to do this whenever you see your dough flattened out quite a lot. This is a great way to compensate for a lack of dough strength development. If you don't have time, you can skip them completely. Wait for your sample to reach the desired size increase. More on that later. Now once it's done, we divide and pre-shape to then shape. In this case, I'm skipping dividing and pre-shaping as I'm only making one loaf. But in case you wanted to make hundreds or thousands, this is what you would have to do. This starts the proofing stage. There are many methods. It mostly depends on your schedule. In this case, when developing the recipe, my dough was finished quite late in the evening. 6 p.m. for us Germans. We like to go to bed early. That's why I opted to proof it shortly at room temperature and then move it into the fridge overnight. Then the next day, cross your fingers, it's baking time. I hope everything is going to work out for you. Enough talking, let's get started with the actual steps. And again, I added chapters to this video so that you can skip to the parts that interest you the most. I already added flour and salt, 400 grams of whole wheat flour and eight grams of salt. That's 2% based on Baker's math. And now next up, I'm going to be adding the water. And for the water, it's very important that the water has roughly the same temperature as your ambient temperature. This makes sure that you have a smooth fermentation process. If you don't, then likely your dough is either going to ferment slower or faster. And the one trick that we will be using is we will be extracting a small sample from the dough to monitor when the dough is done bulk fermenting. And this is really essential for a whole wheat bread. You have to monitor that fermentation process exactly on point. And I failed so many times and this is gonna make you nail the bread. And for that, it's essential that we have the same temperature in the dough as in your environment. Now, if your temperature inside of your kitchen changes a lot throughout the day, you might want to consider using a large container. It should be a rectangular container. Instead of using a sample, you just want to mark that container. This way, no matter if the temperature changes, you can absorb your dough. It also comes with a few drawbacks, as it's not so easy to stretch and fold the dough inside of this container. Then I'll be adding 85% in terms of Baker's math as water, that's 340 grams for 400 grams of whole wheat flour. Next up, I'm adding my whole wheat starter, which I fed yesterday evening using a one to five to five ratio. This makes sure that it doesn't have so much acidity to start with. This makes really sure that I have a smooth fermentation process. But you really wanna make sure that you give your starter a couple of feedings to make it very, very active. I suggest at least to have it for two or three days at room temperature with daily one to five to five feedings. This really makes you an excellent active sourdough starter. Now the trick for this recipe is that we will have a relatively slow fermentation because here in Germany, it's relatively cold right now. That's why we are also skipping the autolysis. Everything is gonna take roughly 12 hours, I guess, to finish at this temperature. If it's warmer for you, if you're living in the tropics, you might wanna do an autolysis at the start of this recipe, just mixing flour and water and letting that sit for maybe two hours at room temperature. That's because your main fermentation process is going to be a lot faster than mine. And the long period over which we are fermenting, in my case, roughly 12 hours, I don't know exactly, we will see with this trick, makes sure that your flour starts to break down and that makes it very easy for your sourdough to digest your flour and to inflate your flour. And so if you don't ferment for 12 hours, you need to add a little bit of an auto lease at the start that you're roughly ending also at 12 hours of uh, fermentation time. Now, just for very rough guidelines, I made a small table that shows you based on your room temperature for how long you should approximately ferment. However, it's not really reliable. It should just give you a rough indicator. Use the sample size and you will win at bulk fermenting. So let's add our sourdough starter. I'm using 20% 
based on the flour, that's 80 grams. And let's hope I, ooh, just a few grams off. <laughs> Great, oh no, now, I'm, now it's a little too, more, too much. <laughs> I hate it when this happens. Now it's pretty much just stirring everything together for roughly 10 minutes. You wanna create a lot of dough strength. I do have a full video on creating dough strength, which I will be linking right here. There I show a couple of different methods. I'll be showing them in this video as well, but if you're interested, definitely check out that video. If you have a kitchen machine, then of course you could be using the kitchen machine. Although I always suggest that you do everything by hand so that you develop a feeling for how the dough feels. It's really essential, especially at the start. So I'll be doing this by hand, roughly 10 minutes of kneading, then I'll take a small break. Uh, then I'll do a set of bench kneading and then quick lamination. I'll show you everything, nothing to worry. Don't be scared of those words. It's just some fancy baker words. And uh, then we should have a superb dough, which has a lot of strength. And then all our sourdough needs to do is inflate it and create a super dough. And I'm hoping that that's going to work. We will see ourselves. I just like to incorporate everything like this at the start, homogenize it, and then I'm gonna start my crazy kneading action. My hand is my dough hook. Hello. Roughly 10 minutes later of hand kneading like this. And have a look, the gluten network is still not there where I want it to be. The dough is still somewhat towering. So I'm gonna be taking a break now. For five minutes, I will just let that sit. And then I'm gonna continue bench kneading. See here, this is not what we want. We need to have a strong gluten network. Okay, here we go, roughly five minutes later. And this waiting is always magical. Just have a look. <laughs> this is also what the autolysis normally does. We have a great gluten development just by waiting a little bit. I'm gonna be taking this out of the container now, and then I will be doing bench kneading. And this bench kneading is really creating superb amounts of strength. That's what I love about it. And since this is relatively wet though, we have to make sure that we create as much dough strength as possible. And the trick for this is just you put the dough on the surface and then you stretch it out and you fold it over. This way you glue your dough together pretty much. And this really creates a superb amount of dough strength. I'll be doing this for roughly another five minutes. Just have a note, uh, the dough is still relatively sticky, but that's normal because we're also, all the time when we do this bench kneading, we're tearing the surface of the dough a little bit but this is really great uh, gluten development. I'm just gonna be rounding this up a little bit. And now comes this one trick that will always make you ferment on time. And that's just extracting a small uh, piece of the dough. We will be monitoring that. And depending on how much it grows in size, we know that this main dough is ready. That's why also we made sure that the dough has exactly room temperature. I'm gonna be waiting another five minutes. I'll be cleaning my hands and then we will be doing the final set of strength development. So I rounded up the dough and I'm now just going to let it sit and note how the dough in those five minutes is not going to spread up, spread out as much. This is already a sign of good gluten development. Note how the dough didn't spread out that much anymore. That's what you want. At the same time, I also prepared a smaller jar and added a rubber band. And the next bulk fermentation is going to be complete the moment this has not doubled in size. This depends a little bit on your flour. The more protein you have, the better. Um, I'm gonna be opting for 50%. Based on my tests with this flour, a half size increase is gonna work for this flour. If I ferment for too long, then I might be running into some issues of over fermentation. Um, keep this close all the time. It should be the same temperature. That's, yeah, that's why we uh, made sure that the water was room temperature as well. I'm gonna cover this. I don't want this to dry out. I try to extract it as fast as possible, but I also want this to have the same dough strength as this main dough. Now the lamination is going to be adding a little bit more dough strength, of course, but it's a good um, it's a good balance of extracting it as soon as you add the sourdough starter and having at least a little bit of dough strength. That's why I always like to extract it after uh, bench kneading. And to finish our strength creation, we will be laminating this dough now. And for this, I am wetting my hands and then I'm just going to 
spread out the dough like this on the surface. This is pr pretty much just like uh, bench kneading. I like to call this uh, bench kneading on crack. Note how the dough still resists a little bit, the urge to be put into a shape. That's because we didn't let our dough relax so long. Um, if you were to let your dough relax a little bit longer, oh now it's tearing a little bit, not so good, but nothing to worry really. If you were to relax your dough for a little bit longer after the bench kneading, this would even be easier. So you see, I can't completely stretch it like this, not like my bread flour dough, but this is okay. The idea is that we have a big surface area on which we will glue the dough together. So I'm just gonna be taking the one side and I will be putting this here in the middle, tuck this down a little bit. Then I'm gonna be doing exactly the same thing from the other side. Like this. From this side, I'm just gluing the dough together. That's really the secret. And also that it sticks to the surface so that you can actually take the dough and move it outwards. With flour on the bottom, I couldn't do that. The dough would just follow my movements. Then I just take the dough like this and I will be doing one more folding like this. If you wanna practice shaping, this is also a good place, good time to just practice some shaping. You will be creating those strength and at the same time, you can practice some shaping. Okay, so that's what I did. I just did some shaping, but you don't have to do that. But now one thing for sure is you wanna make this a nice smooth round ball because then when you touch the dough, you have less surface area that you are touching. A non-round ball is always going to be more difficult to handle. So make this nice and round. And for that, you can use your dough scraper or just use the hand at a 45 degree angle, push inside of the dough. Note how this is not moving. I'm just dragging the dough over the sur surface like this. And my pinkies, I think that's the correct English name, are on the surface. Yep, just like that. That makes sure that I... Uh, take as much dough with me as possible. Now there's still some dough left here, that's why a bench scraper could be handy, but it's not required. Next up, I'll be taking this dough and I'll be transferring this into a clean container. What I like about this container is that in the end of everything, we can just flip over the dough and it will come right out hopefully and we don't have to do any pre-shaping. That's why I like this container. I got it from Ikea at some point um, they don't make those anymore, unfortunately not in that size, but uh, if you find a good container, please drop a comment in the comments, something where you can buy it. I would definitely appreciate that. So yeah, this is the dough. I'm going to be closing this now. And whenever I see that the dough flattened out quite a lot, I'll be applying another coil fold and nothing to worry. I'll be showing you exactly how to do that. And once this year has the 50% size increase, we are ready, we can proceed with shaping. So yeah, that was a lot of information, sorry for that. But uh, yeah, that's how you make this amazing bread and you will definitely be very happy with this bread. It's been roughly five hours and this is actually the first time I'm doing a stretch and fold with this dough. And now let me show you how I do that. The method I use is called a coil fold. With the wetted hands, I'm just removing the dough from the container a little bit. This will make it easier. And then using both hands, I just go into the dough, lift this upwards. Now, if it doesn't go all the way out, no worries. I just repeat this twice and then it should work. Then I do the same thing from the other side. And this is creating a lot of dough strength. At the same time, it comes at a cost of evening out your crumb a little bit. Now I will also do this from this side and then from the other side. This is a perfect looking dough right here and uh, don't overdo this. Just do this whenever you see your dough flatten out quite a lot. That's when you wanna apply the coil fold. I see people doing this forcefully every one hour, but you really don't have to. This dough is perfect like this. It holds its strength. That why, that's why we did all that kneading at the start. Of course, if you didn't knead as much, you could be doing more coil folds just to uh, fix what you didn't do at the start. But this dough like this is looking perfect. And looking at my sample, look at how nice and bubbly it already is. 
I would say it's probably at least a 50% size increase. I have to be very careful now because every minute that I'm waiting, I'm running into the danger of fermenting my dough too much. And then it just becomes very, very sticky. So I opted for the roughly 50% because I never baked with this flour before, but this is something that I'm gonna be experimenting on. How much can I go? What's the maximum for this flour? And this is unique per flour. So enough said, let's proceed and shape this beautiful dough. I will start by just sprinkling some flour here on top of my dough. This side is going to be at the bottom and a little bit. I don't want this to stick to my surface now. This is what I like about this container. Normally, if you wouldn't have a container like this, you would need to take the dough out and do a little bit of pre-shaping to rounden up the dough. Now, if you want to make multiple loaves, that's definitely something you have to do anyways. However, if I just bake one loaf at the time, I can just flip this over and I don't have to pre-shape because this already has the perfect shape for shaping. I already prepared a banneton here with a liner. This liner is really excellent, especially when you have a very wet and sticky dough. This makes sure your dough simply does not stick. So let me flip this over. It's been roughly nine hours since I started the whole fermentation process. And <laughs> perfect. This is what I like. It's coming out nice and smooth. I like to just tuck a little bit of additional flour below the dough. This makes shaping a little bit easier. And now I have to glue the dough together, which is pretty much the same shaping process that I also use on my other loaf. So I will take this, fold this in the middle, fold the other side on top, take this out, fold this into the middle, very gently tuck this down. I don't want to degas the dough now. The tighter you shape, the also the, the more you will even out your crumb. So it depends a little bit on what you like to do. This is a tricky part or one of the trickiest parts I feel because I now have to take this and fold this as far here as possible. I'm trying to be gentle again. I don't want my dough to deflate. Now I'm just taking the dough and I'm rotating it. And then I will start rolling the dough upwards. And for this, you need to have some flour on your hands or else this is really challenging. I take this out, stretch this out and then roll this over. Now with my thumbs, I'm pushing into the dough, creating a dough roll. And this dough is so incredibly elastic. This is really very good. What you could do now is you could be sealing those edges if you wanted to. And to do that, you just simply go here and you just tuck this together a little bit. This is just an optional step. It's gonna make your uh, bread look a little bit more beautiful in the end. Same thing from the other side. Great. Now, one thing that I always do these days, which I really like a lot, just give my dough a good rub with some flour. This makes sure the dough does not stick to the uh, banneton liner. And also makes sure that the places which I sealed aren't overly sticky, because normally that's the places where your dough would stick to the liner. With a gentle movement, I have to flip this over. This has to go at the bottom of the Benetton. This will be later on at the top during the bake. You can do this with your hand or with a dough scraper. Dough scraper might make this a little bit easier, but just to show you, you can also do this with your hands. Take the dough very gentle and place it inside of your Benetton. The leftover flour, I like to just sprinkle over this loaf here because I will be wrapping this in a plastic bag and I don't want this to stick to the plastic bag and this really ensures that this does not happen. Good job! If you made it to this point, you have a beautiful dome. This is already so nicely inflated and now it has to proof. And for proofing, what you want to do is you want to use the finger poke test. And I know this sounds ridiculous. Finger poke test. Why would you want to pick poke your dough? That's the word I was looking for. So you will poke your dough here and you will see a small dent. And the moment this dent recovers very slowly, 
that's when you want to start baking your bread. You see now, after roughly a minute, this dent is going to be completely done, so this bread is not done proofing. And starting baking, I always had issues with proofing. I got you covered. I made another video comparing four different proofing methods. All of them work, you just have to decide which one you personally prefer. In one of the recent experiments that I did, I was testing cold proofing versus room temperature proofing. And the cold proofing though had a little bit more oven spring. And that's what I want to do for this loaf as well. I wanted to have as much oven spring as possible. So I'll be opting for the fridge proofing. Now the fridge proofing <laughs> is pretty much what the name says. You proof it inside of your fridge. Me personally, I don't like to put this dough directly into the fridge. I like to proof this a little bit at room temperature. This just makes sure that I have more inflation happening. And then I move this to the fridge. This way you can also adjust a little bit when exactly you want to bake. A good value to begin with is 30 minutes and then try at least another 12 hours inside of your fridge. However, for this loaf, I'm feeling a little bit dangerous and I want to see what's possible. I might end up baking a frisbee. But from the previous bakes, I know that I should be able to at least proof this for an hour at room temperature and then for another 12 hours inside of the fridge. So that's what I'll be doing. One hour at room temperature. Note how the dent recovers very fast right now. I'll show you in an hour. It should be way slower. And then this uh, loaf goes directly in the fridge. And I'm really hoping for good oven spring. Let's see about that. Cover this with something. I like to use a reusable plastic container so it doesn't dry out. And um, yeah, then it's just waiting time for an hour. See you soon, my dough. Oh, and in case you're wondering, this sample doesn't have any purpose for me now because inside of the fridge, this is going to cool down way faster than it does. What I like to do is I just like to take this and wrap it in a little bit of oil and then just bake it in a pan for a little bit. You will have an excellent muffin. Or you could be putting this into your discard starter jar and then bake this the next time you want to bake an amazing discard starter bread. I'll be sharing a link in the description of this video for that bread. Seriously, it's probably my favorite personal bread. I love baking that bread. So don't throw this away. You can't use it anymore for proofing now, but you can do something amazing out of this. Roughly an hour later, you can see how the stand now recovers very slowly. Checking the temperature, the dough roughly is 22 degrees Celsius right now. And over the fridge proofing, it's going to cool down significantly. At some point, the whole fermentation activity almost comes to a halt. And that's why I love using the fridge. You can time when exactly you want to bake the bread and make this work with your own schedule. I took the dough out of the fridge and I place it inside of my hot Dutch oven. This has been preheated for quite a lot. And now it's time to score the bread. For scoring, you want to be using a razor blade. That really works very well. And now with a swift movement, I'm going to cut at a 45 degree angle. This will make sure that the bread will open up in the oven. You can also correct the cut uh, a little bit if you like. Okay, good. Now one more time. I like to give this an additional spritz. For baking, I am changing the setting from fan, which I just used for preheating, to just upper and lower heat. And I'm lowering the temperature to 250 degrees Celsius. A hot temperature at the start is going to make sure that I have a lot of oven spring. After 25 minutes, I will be removing the lid of the Dutch oven. And uh, then I will also lower the temperature to 230 degrees afterwards. I confirmed this in a couple of experiments. This is going to give you the maximum oven spring. So let's see if we get oven spring or not. Please oven spring. I can't believe this is a whole wheat bread. This can easily be one of the best breads I ever made. It looks so perfect. I'm so excited to check out the crumb of this bread. This oven spring really has me surprised because in the previous attempts, it just simply didn't turn out like this. So this one really turned out perfect with that beautiful ear, nice vertical oven spring, even some really tiny blisters here. So 
I'm just I'm just happy and let's see if the crumb can also keep up. The moment of truth. Oh wow. <laughs> I'm really happy. This is an amazing looking crumb. I couldn't have wished for anything more. Seriously, this is perfect. Good signs of proofing here. Uh, a little bit of a wild crumb. Oh, and if I touch it, it just feels so moist. Oh, this is the high hydration dough. Perfect. Good looking crust. <laughs> and uh, I can't wait to take a slice and check this out. Perfect bunny shape right here. I'm so excited to give this a shot. Ah, the crumb is really nice and wet and so crispy with that ear. Mmm, mmm, that's so delicious. The taste this flower has, the brand inside of it, wow. This is just perfect. Mmm, look how nice and sticky this is, still is. This really, I think this is the best sourdough I ever had, probably. Just in terms of taste, consistency, Slight tang to it, not more than the other breads though, so this is really good. This really is the perfect bread. This has been a really long journey for me to master whole wheat, but the end result now is just, it was totally worth it. All the time I spent, all the different experiments, they all led to making this bread. I highly recommend you that you also try this recipe. The taste is just so incredibly rewarding. And if you tell people that this is a whole wheat bread, they will just be surprised. They would not expect that you can make something so delicious out of plain whole wheat. So if you have further tips on baking with whole wheat, please drop them in the comments. I would truly appreciate that. Thank you for watching and following me on this quest. As always, may the gluten be with you and happy baking.